I first got interested in the wine industry when I was about 20 years of age. Um, I got a part-time job in a bottle shop in my hometown, Maharafelt, and um, it really started off from very humble beginnings. Didn't know much about anything wine related, um, but after probably about 12 months in that job, um, I started to consider actually getting into it full time as a career um, and thankfully um, I had met many wonder wonderful people who were already in the trade um, and who were able to impart quite a bit of knowledge um, and wisdom onto me. Um, the next step really was getting my level one and level two wine and spirits education trust exams um, which I did in Belfast and after getting those I decided then I needed to take a bigger step um, so I applied for a job with Heineken Ireland as a brand developer to be based primarily in the north. Um, not that beer was where I wanted to go, um, but I just saw it as a, a way into the drinks trade um, full, full time, which was, which was good. Um, and I did that for 12 months. Met a lot of very, very good people, a lot of interesting people. Um, but probably six or seven months into that job, I realised that uh, the beer industry was not for me. The drinks industry, yes, but but not beer related. Um, so I started to ask a few questions, ask a few people um, where I should head next to take my wine career fur further. And um, a chance meeting with a winemaker in Belfast one night um, turned out to be the turning point because he offered me a job at his winery in New Zealand um, for vintage. Um, I can't remember what year that was, but um, a long time ago. And um, about a week later, I booked a ticket to New Zealand and decided I was going to go and make wine for the next three or four years. Weeks after that, I, I went and actually booked myself a one-way ticket to New Zealand. Um, didn't really know what was going to take place. Knew I had a job offer of some sorts. Um, that was only for vintage, so about a three-month post. Um, had no idea what I was going to do after it. Um, but as luck would have it, I went to New Zealand. Um, I didn't actually end up going to do vintage with Brent. Um, instead, I actually got offered a job with a premium Pinot Noir producer in Central Otago in the South Island called Amosfield. And Amosfield are, are a relatively small wine company as far as wine companies go. Uh, they produce about 30,000 cases of wine a year. Um, that equates to about 500 tonnes of, of fruit coming in every, every vintage. Um, which isn't a lot, it sounds like a lot. If it was in your garage, it would look like a hell of a lot, but um, as far as commercial winemaking goes, that's a, that's a pretty small amount. Um, but they did things well, they did things by the book. Um, there was a lot of heart and soul went into it. And I was luck lucky enough to stay with those guys for just under two years, and I learned an awful lot about winemaking, about selling wine, uh, marketing wine, um, and just everything wine related, really. Um, took off from there in terms of my, my, my career. Um, I managed the cellar door for a while. Um, so I did a lot of public tastings, a lot of private tastings, a lot of trade tastings. Um, was lucky enough to work with um, the chief uh, steward of the Air New Zealand Wine Awards. Um, he worked for Amosfield as well. He had been doing chief steward for the Wine Awards for 26 years. Um, in his mid 70s, he had a lot of knowledge to offer, um, and um, thankfully he became one of my best friends in the process and, and a mentor. Um, and he taught me a lot about New Zealand wine, a lot about Australian wine, and, and world wine, in fact. Um, so, yeah, I spent just under two years with Amosfield, um, a couple of little side projects as well. I managed a friend's vin vineyard for about a year and a half while I was there, um, and I helped. Um, a winemaker called Alan Brady um, to make some wine for 2014 vin vintage and as luck would have it Alan um, is actually from Rathfrey Island in County Down and he was the first man to actually plant Pinot Noir in cent central Otago um, in the early 1980s. He actually left Ireland and went out to um, to work as a TV presenter um, with TVNZ based in Dunedin um, and he had never grown a plant in his life, let alone a grapevine. And um, whilst living in Dunedin, obviously decided that he, he needed a little slice of country in New, New Zealand. So um, 
he bought a little miner's cottage just outside Queenstown in the 70s and uh, basically tore it down, revamped it um, and decided he wanted to grow grapes and, and while everybody told him he was absolutely mad for for uh, taking this up as a hobby, grape growing, um, being Irish and having that pioneering spirit and that Irish spirit in him he decided just to do it anyway um, and the rest is seriously history. Um, the New Zealand wine industry actually wouldn't be where it was today, where it is today, um, had it not be for the work that Alan Brady actually put in in the late seventies and early eighties. Um, he initially started Gibson Valley Wines, the first commercial winery in Samsville, Otago, um, multi-award winning winery as well. Um, bear in mind that while he was planting vines and making wine, um, he had no, nobody there to help him. He was doing this all off his own back, um, financially as well. Um, so I'm sure it was a tough period for, for Alan, um, but he persevered and he came through it and um, in the process set up uh, Mount Edward Wines. Um, and then when he sold that in the early 2000s, he decided to go for his retirement label, um, which he aptly named Wild Irishman. And um, I was lucky enough to work with him for the entirety of my time in New Zealand. And again, like... Um, like my colleague at Amosfield, Alan imparted a lot of knowledge. Um, got to try some amazing wines that I would never have tried had it not been for meeting these guys. Um, and I think that uh, that experience in in itself, just meeting another Irish man who wanted to go away and just learn as much about wine and make wine, um, was really really good. Helped with the homesickness. It was nice to go up to his house every other evening and just hear his voice and converse and not have to slow our accents down so that other people could understand. We were able to just um, sit at his kitchen table and crack open a bottle of wine and, and, and just pretend that we were at home. Um, and it was nice, very, very nice, and I miss it already. Um, but those days are gone, and I moved then after Amosfield to Australia. Um, and I went to Australia and managed to get a job with a, a, a really old um, family-run winery called Tabilk and Tabilk are based in central Victoria and as luck would have it, Tabilk um, actually offered Cabrosa Wines the contract to sell their wines in the north of Ireland. Um, so it makes this whole transition a little bit easier um, coming from the winery, um, being part of the winemaking team for Vintage and then coming back here, having the chance to actually sell those wines is, is, is really unique and I don't think there's too many people in the country um, can say that they've done that. Um, and while I was with Tabilk um, I had the opportunity to um, to go and work for the Kelly's Patch crew and um, as many of you might know Kelly's Patch is, is exclusive to Ireland, sold only in Ireland, north and south, primarily in the north um, and um, that wine is, is, is owned, the brand is owned solely by Caruso Wines um, so again it makes the, tra the transition a bit easier being able to come back home and sell your wares um, and tell people that literally your blood, sweat and tears have gone into making that wine um, and as I said before I think that that is really really unique and, and um, hopefully customers can relate to that and um, I think it's nice what Cabrosa Wines have done with the Kelly's Patch brand whereby they're trying to make wine more accessible to to everybody because unfortunately wine is a very very taboo sub subject for a lot of people when it shouldn't be at the end of the day it's just fermented grape juice um, and it's not designed to be ripped to shreds by a critic um, and, and bombarded by many many critics who just want to slate it because you know the label doesn't suit them or, or the taste doesn't suit them I mean that's one of the things I love about wine is that it's totally subjective and everybody should have a chance with it um, whether you're drinking wine for the first time or you're a seasoned wine drinker who's been drinking wine for 50 or 60 years it doesn't matter there's wine for everybody out there and um, I think Kelly's Patch is, is, is going down a really, really interesting road where it's opening itself up to the seasoned wine drinker, wine connoisseur, if you want to call them that, um, and somebody who maybe doesn't know much about wine but they know what they like. And I've always been a big advocate for people who just know what, know what they like because when you know what you like, you're, you're already there. You, you, don't, you don't need to listen to anybody else. Um, it's a very subjective thing. And that's something that I learned during my time away, was that um, wine should not be um, deconstructed for the purpose of going into a magazine or a newspaper. 
I mean, there is soul in every single bottle of wine, be that an entry level bottle of wine that cost four or five pounds in the shop or a wine that costs 60 pounds in a shop. Every bottle of wine has been made by someone and there's been a lot of care and attention and um, I'm a big advocate for wine from four or five pounds a bottle right through to a hundred or whatever. Um, there's a time and a place for, for, for every single bottle of wine out there um, as long as it's shared. Oh, yeah. So uh, after I left um, Tabilk and Kelly's Patch um, in early 2015, uh, I came home for about three weeks to plan my wedding, which was fun, and then flew back out to Australia to um, again further my wine career um, because you know the first three years of my travels were, were just unbelievable in the sense that I experienced so much wine related in such a small condensed space of time and met these wonderful characters who imparted copious amounts of wine knowledge onto me. Um, so I really wanted to keep on that curve because I definitely felt like it was an upward curve. Um, so I wanted to ride that out as long as possible. Um, so I flew back out at the end of May 2015 and um, was lucky enough to get an interview um, for a really, really small wine producer in McLaren Vale, which is in South Australia, about 40 minutes south of Adelaide City. Um, and I got an interview uh, with uh, the winery called Alpha Box and Dice. And I had never heard of them. Um, I had done a bit of research and they looked pretty quirky. Um, but what really drew me to that wine company, that winery, um, was that the head winemaker, Justin Lane, um, had never studied winemaking. Um, he had just gone with his gut um, and knew he wanted to make wine. Um, but as I say, he never studied winemaking and, and there, there is this stigma out there that if you want to be a winemaker, you must go um, to a well-respected college and study winemaking for three, four, five years, whatever it takes. Um, you must have your ticket, as a lot of people will say. Um, but wine was never like that. Wine is, is, is for everybody and um, what drew me to Alpha Box and Dice is that Justin went with his gut and said, I'm going to do this anyway. Um, and being from the Hunter Valley in, in New, New South Wales on the East Coast, you know, it was a big step to move to South Australia and, and chase his dream. Um, wine was not in his family, he was just going with his gut. So I resonated a lot with um, Justin and um, I felt that he was probably, probably one of the best people to learn from in the sense that maybe I was on the same journey as him. I didn't come from a wine background. Nobody in Ireland comes from a wine background. Um, so I thought this would be a good chance to learn from somebody who's been through, um, been through a lot, and and definitely he's taken the road less travelled, and and that was the same road that I was on. So we hit it off, and um, pretty much in instantly. And um, the owner of the winery, Dylan, um, we hit it off as well, and. I had applied for a cellar door position, so I was just going to work in the cellar door and, and do public tastings, private tastings, trade tastings, whatever. Um, but when I got chatting to Justin properly, he offered me um, basically an assistant winemaker's role, um, which I sort of had to sort of count my lucky stars that, that, that um, he had offered because most people wouldn't offer a crazy Irish man an assistant winemaker's role in South Australia, which is the capital of wine, probably in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, you know, you've got some seriously good wine wineries in South Australia, the likes of Penfolds, who've been there for a long, long time. Um, you've got the lovely Barossa Valley, the Adelaide Hills, Clare Valley, and of course McLaren Vale. So I was really, really lucky and blessed, I think, to, to be offered that position. And um, I basically said yes after about two seconds. And um, I had an incredible seven months with Alpha Box and Dice where I learned a lot about the art of winemaking um, because it is indeed an art, I do believe. Um, it's craft. And um, I learned a lot about blending. Um, I learned a lot about Italian varieties. Um, I wasn't too heavily schooled on Italian varieties. I knew a bit, but Justin um, had spent many, many years in Italy and um, decided that he was going to make a lot of, of Italian inspired wines and um, on his return to South Australia he, he, he began working with growers who grew um, the likes of Sangiovese, Montepulciano, Dolcetto, Arnais, um, Nebbiolo, Alianico, you know the list goes on, he works with them all. Um, he wanted to take what he'd learned and, and, and apply it himself and 
pretty much that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to take what I've learned from Justin and, and um, my friends in New Zealand and Australia and, and um, apply it to what I was doing and, and bring my own little mark to the wines as well, um, if I could. And uh, yeah, I did that for about seven months. Um, again, learned learned an awful lot. And, and uh, the one thing I will say about wine is, and probably my favourite thing about wine, is that the more the more you learn about wine, the more you realise you actually don't know. So it's this amazing circle of never-ending knowledge whereby you think you're going to get to this end goal where you can say, I know everything there is to know about wine. Um, and the closer you get to that, the further you get away from it because you'll never know everything there is to learn about wine. Wine is so vast. Um, but that's why I love it. It's, it's a continuing learning experience and it always will be until the day I drop. <laughs>